We'll see if that works. Okay. Thankful for the presence of each and every one. Good to be back with you and thankful for the prayers that I'm sure all of you prayed for our safe journey to and from, for the gospel meeting itself, and certainly it was good to be with the church. Uh, we've been familiar with the church there for a little over 20-some years, although this makes the second time if I keep my record straight, and I don't. But the best I can tell, it was my second time being with the church there. So certainly glad for that opportunity and invitation. Good to be with Deanna and Verlin. He had his, finally, his rheumatoid arthritis doctor appointment that he'd been waiting for about four months in order to be able to get, had it on Thursday before we went and the news was not good. The doctor he'd been going to had put him on uh, prednisone, and that was to help alleviate the pain that he was experiencing from the swelling and the joint pain. And the doctor wasn't really able to do anything for him until he got off of the prednisone. And of course, that puts him back into an area where it's very difficult to even get around the wall but he wants him off of it for seven weeks to taper off and then come back to him so that the doctor can really get a full indication of the things that is going on with him. So I truly ask that you continue to remember him in your prayers as he continues to uh, labor for the church there at Lakeview as well as he has a secular job as well that he's able to do it at home, but certainly, uh, we all know what it's like to operate and try to conduct our lives day after day, night after night in pain. But it's good to be back with you and thankful for uh, Jake and his filling in for me that Sunday evening and for Ruben filling in this past Wednesday evening. So good to be with you and thankful again for all of your prayers. What I want us to look at today is, is it a sin to wear short Attire. We know we've had a hot summer, but this is really a subject that really doesn't pertain to the weather all that much because it's something that is to be seen year round. And so, therefore, there's no real time period for which it is better or worse for us to consider this subject. Is it a sin? First of all, we need to understand what it is that constitutes sin. We know from the scriptures that sin is a violation of God's law. We know that from verses like 1 John 3 and verse 4. Whosoever commits, I'm sorry, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So that's our definition of sin that's given to us by God through his word. But also there's a passage in Romans 4 in verse 15. Because the law worketh wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. So again, we see the common word in both of these verses that tells us what sin is. It's transgression. Trespassing, I guess is a good way to use it since we're more familiar with trespassing than maybe we are with the word transgression. But what we must understand, too, concerning sin and the answering of questions as to whether or not things are sin is that it doesn't have to be specifically stated in order for it to be sin. And what I mean by that is that there may be certain principles that govern a thing that helps us to see the cause of these principles that God's Word teaches us, we know that they are sin. So that's what we want to look at. What are the principles that govern the clothes that we wear? What is the line to be drawn, if indeed there is a line to be drawn? And another thing that we hope in our study to understand is can you bear responsibility for sexual thoughts of others because that certainly plays a role when it comes down to the matter 
of the clothes that we wear. Let's consider some things. The Bible sets guidelines about clothing. Now, that statement is true because if it's not, then clothes don't matter. I mean, we all understand that. If the Bible doesn't set the guidelines, then whatever it is that we wear doesn't matter. But at the same time, if the Bible does set guidelines, then that makes the Bible the standard. And that's what we need to recognize as the standard. Not what you think, not what I think, not what society, the day, the culture, the fads are that are going on around us. It becomes then the Bible to be the standard. If indeed the Bible has set guidelines in this matter of clothing. And therefore, as we've already seen, if we transgress those guidelines concerning clothing, then we have sinned. Again, reminding ourselves of 1 John chapter 4, or chapter 3 and verse 4, and Romans 4 and verse 15. Something else to consider. The question is, what are these guidelines? Since the Bible does set guidelines, what are those guidelines? What are the specific instructions that are given in God's Word? What are the principles that are involved that we need to understand that will help us to know whether or not a certain type of clothing violates these principles. In other words, to be able then for us to make the application. It's one thing to know the principles, it's one thing to understand the guidelines, but then what is, how do we make the applications of those principles, of those guidelines? You know, there can be really no doubt about it, that it is possible to dress in a way that's wrong. We see just one example of this, and that's, I think, enough for us to see, although we could go into many. For example, Proverbs, in chapter 7, and verse 10, and there was a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. So here, clothing is made mention, and a certain type, a particular type of clothing is called out the attire of a harlot. I know that the Living Bible is not a translation. It is a paraphrase at, <laughs> at best, but I think it describes for us what the attire of a harlot is all about. And it states that she dressed seductively. That is the attire of and of course, other translations on the word harlot uses the word prostitute. Other translations use the word whore. So the attire of a harlot is certainly, no doubt, attire that is intended to seduce those that look upon her. So we see it's possible, certainly, to dress in the wrong way. So in answering that question, is wearing short a tire, a sin, let us understand that there has been divinely made clothes that we can read about in the beginning. God made clothes, if you want to say it that way, that God made in the beginning. In Genesis 3, notice what we receive in verse 7. This is, of course, after God has placed Adam and Eve in the garden, given them the rules of which they are to live by, living in the garden of Eden, he tells them that there is one tree that they have not eat of, all of the rest of the trees they could. But we find by the time we read verse 7 of chapter 3, Eve has been tempted. She has eaten of the fruit she has given to her husband, and now he has eaten. And what we see is that when they eat of this forbidden fruit, when they transgress God's law, here's what happens. The eyes of them both were opened. 
and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed big leaves together and made themselves aprons. So as a result of sin, it was as Satan said, you are no good from evil. Well, now they're no good from evil. They both realized that they were naked. And we can understand that this word naked that's being used in this verse certainly has reference to nudity. And if we're not careful, if in fact it may already be, that we, and we hear the word naked, we just automatically think and we only think in terms of being totally nude. That's, that's our definition of naked, being totally nude. But I want us to go on and see what they did. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So they themselves made clothes that were described in that verse as aprons. But then notice what it says in verse 10. When God came that later in the garden and they heard him, he calls out and he says, where are you? In verse 10, Adam says, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. So here Adam and Eve, they are nude, but they make for themselves aprons. And now having worn these aprons, when God appears, Adam says that we are naked. He still uses the same word. But here's the point I want us to see. The same word is used when they were totally nude, and the same word is used when they had aprons that they had made themselves. Now, concerning this word apron, the word apron is, again, remember, this is what they made for themselves. And what I have here are at least five, either Hebrew lexins or commentaries of those that have an understanding of the Hebrew language. And here in all of these that I've listed, here's basically what they all say concerning the apron, that it was girdle-like. A girdle was that which goes around the midsection. We understand where girdles go. And then the other word that was common among all of these scholars and lections was it was a loin cloth type of garment. Again, something that covers the midsection of the body. So this is the apron that Adam and Eve made from the fig leaves, an article of clothing that covered the midsection as a girdle or as a loin cloth. And then we go back to a passage in Genesis and we read verse 21. Where God said also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. See in verse seven, they were naked. In verse 10, they had aprons, they were still was said to be naked. And now we see that God has made them tunics. The King James Version says coat. We'll, we'll say something about that in a minute. But the New King James and most other translations uses the word tunic. And in reference to what God made, we don't see the word naked anymore. Instead, what do we see? The clothed. God clothed them. Now concerning this tunic, it was an article of clothing that covered from the shoulders down to the knee. Completely different article of clothing as opposed to an apron. In fact, if you look at the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia and the article that it had on dress that's found in volume two on page 877, here's what it says concerning the word satin, which is tunic. 
It resembles the Roman tunic, corresponding most nearly to our long shirt, reaching below the knees always, and in case it was designed for dress occasions, reaching almost to the ground. Now if we look at the Hebrew word itself, we see that it means, and this is from Genesis on page 420 of his lexicon, it says a tunic, generally with sleeves coming down to the knees. And Frank Wright wrote a book on manners and customs of Bible lands, and here's what he said concerning the tunic. The tunic inappropriately translated coat, as we find in the King James, was a shirt which was worn next to the skin. It was made of leather, hair cloth, wool, linen, or in modern times, usually of cotton. The simplest form of it was without sleeves and reached to the knees or sometimes to the ankles. The well-to-do wore it with sleeves and extending to the ankles. Women as well as men wore it, although there was no doubt a difference in style and pattern in what was worn by the two. So this is what we have when we go back and consider again what took place in the beginning. What took place in the matter of clothing that God had a direct hand in what it is that he wanted done. Adam and Eve sinned. Because of their sin, they realized they were naked. They were nude. They prepared for themselves what they thought would be sufficient. But that even then, they still were naked. Not nude, but improperly clothed. And it was not until God made the tunics that the statement was made in all truthfulness and in all correctness that now Adam and Eve are clothed. So what we see from all of this, man was naked, man attempted to clothe himself. And man's attempt, obviously, obviously did not cover enough the aprons, the midsection that it covered was not enough. God then made clothing that did cover. And it covered from the word tunic, from the shoulders down to the knee. So what we see in all of this is that God put proper clothing on man and woman. So we see that truly God must have something in mind when it comes to clothing. That it's not as some people think that with God it doesn't matter. Because I think we see in Genesis 3 that it does matter. It, does, it is a matter that matters to God as to what men and women wear or in the manner in which the clothing it is and what it covers of their bodies. Here's another principle, and I want, of course, all of these points that I'm trying to cover are important, but here is something that if there's no, if there's hardly any other point that you don't understand too well, understand this one, because I think this one truly is where there is a failing on the part of so many of us to understand what nakedness is. Exposing the thigh is nakedness. We know that nakedness is shameful. There's no doubt about that. Whether it was the total nudity that Adam and Eve had in verse 7, or whether it was the partial clothing that they had in verse 10. Both of them were naked. Both situations were constituted as naked. And nakedness is shameful. We see it in Genesis 3 and verse 7. When the eyes of both of them were opened, they knew they were naked. What does that tell us? That they sensed shame. Now that they had aided the forbidden fruit. Now that they did have the knowledge of good and evil. 
They realized that their nakedness was something of which they needed to be ashamed. And what did they do? They set about and they sold fig leaves to make themselves aprons. It's in Leviticus chapter 18, verses 6 and 7, that none of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother, you shall not uncover. She is your mother's. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Why? Because there's shame involved in nakedness. So we must understand that. We live in a society where nakedness is not a shame. Have we become so conditioned because of the world that we live in that we no longer consider it a shame? Well, we need to get our thinking back in order. Nakedness is a shame. Whether it's total nudity or whether it's partially being clothed, but not sufficiently clothed. Nakedness is a shame. We see that in the letter to the church at Thyra Tower. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Are not all of these things, things of which the church of Laodicea needed to be and ought to have been ashamed? Certainly. Well, what is one of them? One of them is naked. We see also in Revelation 16 and verse 15, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Let's look at one other one. Chapter 17, verse 16. And the ten horns that you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her destitute and naked, flesh and burn her with fire. Eat her flesh and burn her with fire. There's no doubt about it that partial nudity is nakedness. I hope we've established that. Have we not established that already in Genesis 3 and verse 10? Partial nudity. They had on aprons. They had on loincloths. They were covering the midsection of the body, but they were naked, not nude, but partly clothed improperly partly clothed. So partial nudity is nakedness. So here we, let's just look at it like this and make sure we understand the difference between being completely nude and being partially nude. I guess is a better way to say it. Thayer says that to be completely nude is to be unclad. That is without clothing. That's complete nudity. But in the terms of what we see in verse 10 of Genesis 3, we see partial nudity. We still see naked, but it's not complete total. It's partly nude. And to that, Thayer says, it's ill-clad or clad in an undergarment only. Kettle says it's badly clad or not fully clothed. And Lindell and Scott says partial nudity is lightly clad. Can we not see the point? The point is one can have some clothing on and still be naked. And we have Bible for that. We have Genesis 3 and verse 10 that proves that to be the case. Back to the point that we're talking about concerning the thigh. Exposing the thigh is exposing one's nakedness. We're not talking about the loin. We're not talking about the midsection anymore. We're talking that of the legs from the hip to the knee. That is the thigh of a human being. Exposing the thigh is exposing our nakedness. In 
Genesis 3, we've done with this. Verse 7, verse 10, verse 21. From being naked with no clothes, from being naked with partial clothes, to being clothed after God did the job. Man's job didn't accomplish what God wanted. So God gave to Adam and Eve that which they could be clothed. So see, this is what we're talking about concerning nakedness. We're talking about that section of the body from the hips to the knees. We're not talking about the aprons. When we talk about thighs, we're talking about this part of the body. In reference to the priest under the law. In Exodus 28, verse 42, you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. So see, this is clearly showing us what God considers nakedness. Clothing to cover from the waist to the thigh is what God commanded in the appeal of the priest. Why? Because this is God's definition of nakedness. This is God saying what the line is to be drawn to understand what nakedness in a human being is all about and also to associate the shame that needs to go along with nakedness. And then there's another passage in Isaiah in chapter 47, verse 2. Take the millstone and grind meal. Remove your veil. Take off the skirt. Uncover the thigh. Pass through the river. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not arbitrate with the man. So look, we, we've got a lot of things here in what's stated in this passage. To uncover the thigh. See, there is again the thing that God considers naked if it's uncovered. Uncover the thigh. Your nakedness will be uncovered. So when the thighs are exposed, we are naked, according to what God's Word says. And if our thighs are exposed, we are naked, and then what else is? Your shame will be seen. You know, I don't know how, <laughs> how to put it any plainer. When a person sees your thigh, they're seeing your nakedness. Now, I, don't, I know that don't go in our world today. But have we not seen that this is what God's definition? Is this, can we not see that this is where God draws the line? Then when a person sees your thigh, whether you're a man or a woman, and they see your thigh, they're seeing your nakedness. And there are a lot of things that are capable of putting us into that position. Bathing suits. There's no way you can adorn a baby suit, a bath, a baby suit, a, bath, a bathing suit, and not expose your thighs. Along with a lot of other things. But your thighs are exposed in a bathing suit. Your thighs can be exposed in the shorts that you wear. Your thighs can be exposed in the skirt or the dress that you wear. Now these are perfectly legitimate articles of clothing, but see, they involve the possibility that even though you're standing, your thighs are covered. But then if you're not careful when you sit or when you engage in some other activity, when you don't, when you're not careful of the positions that you allow yourself 
to get into, the positions that you allow your legs to get into, you're even in shorts that are covering the thigh at one point and dresses and skirts that are covering the thigh at one point, there can be those occasions when you're exposing your thighs. And what happens when you do that? You're exposing nakedness, your nakedness. You ought to be ashamed. And I'm saying in terms of shorts, this is something that needs to apply to both men and women. May the day never come that, that men wear dresses and skirts, although I wouldn't be surprised if and when it does. But this lesson needs to be understood because I've seen individuals in this congregation who wear shorts that I can see sometimes when they're sitting down, I can see halfway up their knee and their hip. They're showing their thighs. They're showing their nakedness. And they need to be ashamed. When it rides up above your knee, whatever the article of clothing, you're doing the very thing that is showing your nakedness, your, your thighs. Then there's the splits that sometimes women wear in their dresses or skirts. Nothing wrong with the slit. I mean, if it's from the knee down, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that slits are wrong to have on a dress or a skirt. But if that slit exposes any part of the thigh then God says, you're exposing your nakedness and you ought to be ashamed. And let me, last but not least, don't forget this one. You know, in my day, when I was growing up in school, it was, it was a shame to wear faded jeans. <laughs> but now, it's almost as if the jeans are just barely hanging on them because there's so many holes. And, and what are they doing? You're seeing their thighs. So holes in the jeans are things that we need to understand are exposing our nakedness and we need to be ashamed of. We need to make applications of these things. And these are some of the areas that we can best make the application of. And then there's the principle of modesty. And we have a passage to deal with in this. First Timothy 2 and verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which professes women, I'm sorry, that which professed, <laughs> I'll get it, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. I'll read it this time, but I want us to focus on the individual words, and this time we want to look at this word modest. The meaning of the word modest is, according to the American Heritage Dictionary, just a common definition, having or showing a moderate estimation of one's own talents, abilities, and value, having a shy, or retiring nature, reserved, observing conventional proprieties in speech, behavior, or dress, quiet and humble in appearance, unpretentious, a modest house, for example, moderate, not extreme, a modest charge. Vine says of the word modest, orderly, well-arranged, decent. The well-ordering in not of dress and demeanor only, but of the inner life, uttering indeed and expressing itself in the outward conversation. And Strong says of the word orderly, that is, the course of good behavior, from the word that means orderly or well-arranged. And Thayer says well-arranged, seemly, modest. So we see then that in all of this what modesty is. We see that it means to be reserved. 
It means to be not drawing attention to. It means to be respectable. It means to be decent. It means to be orderly in all of these things. Then there's shame that we see in the same verse that we looked at. The word there is shamed faceness. The King James, if you use it, uses the word shamefacedness. The New King James, or rather the American Standard Version, uses shamefastness. The New King James uses the word propriety. It's from the word which means a sense of shame, modesty, shamefastness in that modesty which is fast or rooted in the character. Strong suggests that it may be from two words, which could give the idea of downcast eyes. So it means bashfulness. So that's involved in the word shamefacedness. And then there's the principle of good judgment. Again, back to our passage in 1 Timothy 2, there the word sobriety. And of that word, we find the King James uses the word sobriety. The New King James uses the word moderation. And it's from a word that means soundness of mind, sound judgment, practically expressing the meaning that it is that habitual inter self government with its constant reign on all of the passions and the desires which would hinder the temptation to those from arising. Vine says. Strong says it's soundness of mind that is sanity, or in a figurative sense, self-control. So here's what this word, sobriety, in talking about good judgment. To dress with sobriety is to dress so that you don't show what others shouldn't see. So these are the things that are involved and helping us to answer this question of, is it a sin? Is it a sin to wear short attire? We've seen what God directly involved himself in doing with the first man and woman. We've seen that God sets the thigh as one of those things that constitutes nakedness. We have seen from what we've read in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9 that involved is the principles of modesty, the principles of shame, and the principles of good judgment. So regardless of the time of the year, regardless of the weather, let's make sure that we, in the choosing of the clothing that we wear, understand what God's word says. And I hope no one, no one goes away thinking, oh, well, that's just what he always thinks. If I'm wrong, tell me. If these are not the truth in the matter, if God did not do what he did in Genesis 3, and if God has not set and determined at least one aspect of nakedness involving the showing of the thigh, and if he's not given us 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9 to guide us in concerning shamefacedness, or modesty, shamefacedness, and sobriety, then please, for the sake of all of us, we need the truth in the matter. But we're not, if, if this is the truth, then what I'm asking all of us to do is to apply it. Apply the truth. Because without application of the truth, what good is the knowledge of the truth? What good is it? What kind of an example are we showing to our fellow Christians? And what kind of an example are we being before the world when they're able to see our eyes just as we see theirs? What's the example? What's the, what's the statement that's being made? Clothes make a statement. They always have. They always will. 
And what the Bible always says concerning our clothing, the statement that it ought to be making is the expression of what we are in here. What we are in our hearts. Profession God. That's what man and woman, Christian, needs to be doing in their dress, in their language, in every aspect of their life. Professing what they are supposed to be in here. So the lesson is yours. And I hope you will keep in mind the points that we've talked about. And talk with me if these are not points that are legitimate. Please do. This morning, if there are those that are here who have not obeyed the gospel, now is the time and opportunity. We must not let such opportunities as this to encourage those that are not Christians to look at their lives, to see that sin separates you from God, and that sin is not going to enter into heaven. You must have sins forgiven, and that was the entire purpose of what we did just a moment ago in remembering the Lord's death and his suffering. He shed his blood that we might have the forgiveness of sin, that we might be in fellowship with God, that we might have the hope of heaven after the resurrection and after the judgment. If you're here and you obey the gospel and yet as a Christian, there's so much of this world that may have come into your life, come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord. And he will be our father, and we can be your children. But it takes repentance on the part of us that have sinned as his children. Repent and pray that those things might be forgiven. If we can assist you in any of these, let it be known. While together we stand to sing.